Alrighty guys, welcome back to the shop. Today's video is going to be a full tutorial on how to build a heat treating oven. Now heat treating ovens are a very valuable tool for a knife maker. They allow the knife maker to heat treat their blades at very specific temperatures. While 1084 may not need this and you can heat treat that in a forge, some designer steels need to have specific temperatures and soak times to be properly heat treated. There are currently two manufacturers that make heat treating ovens that cater to knife makers, and they are Paragon and Evenheat. While both of these manufacturers make beautiful ovens that work extremely well, their price tags can range between $1,700 and $2,100, which is cost prohibitive for many knife makers. The goal of this video will be to condense everything that I have researched on how to build a heat treating oven and then work through all of those steps. I have learned a ton researching heat treating ovens on the forums at bladeforms.com. I've also learned a ton from Dan Como's blog. And then there's other YouTubers who have made heat treating ovens and I've watched all of those videos for sure. So with all that that I have learned, I will be condensing that information into one heat treat oven build and presenting it to you. You'll hear me mention multiple times throughout this video to take a look at the description below. I'll put a full parts list in the description along with affiliate links a wiring diagram, and other resources for building heat treating ovens. The last thing I want to mention here in the intro is that this project can be dangerous. We will be dealing with high voltage that can kill you. I am not an electrician. I'm guessing you are also not an electrician. So take on this project at your own risk, and Redbeard Ops cannot be liable for you shocking the shit out of yourself. The first step of the process will be making our coils. In order to do this appropriately, there is a little bit of math in the middle of this section. I got my Canthal A1 16 American wire gauge from kilnparts.com. I'll be making my coils on a piece of 3 8 bar. The first step is to drill an eighth of an inch hole in the end of your coiling bar. This will allow you to thread the wire through that hole and hold the wire onto the bar. I then took two pieces of 2x4 and attached them to each other. I will be drilling a 15 30 seconds hole in the center of these two pieces of two by fours. I will then put a 16th of an inch hole in the side so that I have enough space to feed the wire in between the two boards. Using a pair of pliers, I will pull out the wire from one side and then insert the coiling bar into the other. Once we have the bar inserted into our jig, we will then clamp the jig onto the workbench and then thread our wire through the 1 8th of an inch hole in the end of the bar. We will then attach a drill to the other side of the bar so that we can turn this bar and coil the wire. It is worth noting that you should pull away from the jig with the drill slightly in order to get a nice tight coil. You can see that I did not do this on my beginning coils and then started pulling the drill towards my right side in order to get a tighter coil towards the end of this coil. I made sure to order enough of this wire so that I can make extra long coils and then cut them to the appropriate length. For this project, I ordered 85 feet of this 16 gauge Canthal A1 wire. I had more than enough for both of my coils and then a little bit left over at the end. As you can see here, once the coil has been coiled, you can just slip it off the end of your rod. In my case, I will be making two coils, which will be wired together in series. So I have one going along the left wall and one going along the right wall of the inside of my heat treating oven. All right, now it's time to go over some of the design math. There are four terms you need to be familiar with, watts, voltage, amps, and ohms. You can think of these as power, pressure, rate, and pipe size or resistance. To run the numbers for our oven, we'll be using Watt's law, which is named after Mr. James Watt. It is watts times voltage times amps, and amps can be denoted as volts over ohms. The volts portion is going to be fixed at 240 volts, and the amps is going to be a target. To get our target amps, we will look at our breaker. If we have a 20 amp breaker, we want to downrate that by two thirds so that we have a little bit of safety built into the system. In our case, that puts it at 13.3 amps, and then we can back solve for our required ohms. The required ohms is going to be what dictates the length of the coil. We can now use the same formula to find how many watts our oven will have, in this case, 3,200 watts. So let's get an idea of how our DIY oven will compete with the 18 inch versions from Evenheat and Paragon. Our volume dimension of the interior chamber is significantly smaller than these two ovens and the watts are around the same. 
so our power per volume is higher. However, since this is a DIY version, I'm just going to assume that our insulation practices are slightly worse than even heat in Paragon, so hopefully our performance will be about the same. If you want to have an easy calculator for finding all of these numbers, make sure to check out Dan Como's blog. He has a downloadable Excel document that you can easily plug in your values and calculate all of these numbers. When I ran the initial numbers for this oven, my ohms total target was around 18.4 ohms. In order to achieve an 18.4 ohms total target with two coils run in series, each one of those coils needs to be half of the resistance of that target. If they were run in parallel, each of the coils would need to be twice the resistance of the target. This is what it looks like when they are put together in series and I achieved my 18.4 ohms. Now I will caution you when you are building the oven on your own, make sure that you have a little bit extra ohms as in a little bit larger of an ohms target with your coils so that when you fold over the ends and twist them together, you will actually have the appropriate number. When you twist together the ends like this, it lowers the resistance over this part of coil, which is good when you're making your oven because you don't want this part of the coils to get too hot, but it's bad if you are targeting a specific ohms target. In my case, I ended up in the 17 somewhere for the ohms, which is still okay for my 20 amp breaker, and my oven did end up being still under 14 amps, so I'm not too worried. To construct the body and the door of our oven, I ordered 24 soft fire bricks, which will give me one or two extra bricks just in case I end up breaking one. Make sure you do not buy this refractory mortar. I found it to be a pain in the ass to use, and it also did not hold the bricks very well. I've mixed it multiple different ways. I put it onto dry bricks, I put it on the wet bricks, I had a wet slurry and a drier slurry, just everything I tried with this mortar did not work. After 24 hour cures, the bricks came apart easily. Later on in the video, I will show you the mortar that I ended up using, which was way more adhesive and it was a pre-mix and it worked way better. So in order to get our steps into the bricks, I will be using this router bit. This is probably the messiest way to do this process. You can use a saw to cut out these notches and then come back to the router bit to make everything nice and square but I decided to just bring my drill press outside, set up a fence, and do it the dirty way. I investigated four different brick configurations for this oven. Now, it's really a trade-off between efficiency and usable volume in the chamber. A large, very usable chamber volume that you can do very large items in will not be nearly as efficient with the same power as a smaller volume chamber. In my case, I went with a 5 inch tall by 6.5 inch wide by 18 inch deep chamber. I'll show some pictures up here of the other chambers that were in the running for this oven. Once I have the steps cut into both of the sides, I use a piece of plywood with sandpaper over it in order to flatten the top surface of these sides. I then draw a 3 inch circle and straight lines along the sides all the way to the back. These will be where I will cut my grooves for the coils. In order to avoid having to use pins or mortar to keep my coils on the walls, I will be cutting slots into my bricks that capture the coils. To do this, I will use the T-shaped slot cutter that has a quarter inch slot with a half inch T groove. I will then follow up with a round nose cutter in these T-shaped slots in order to allow enough room for my coils to fit in the grooves. Also notice that I labeled each one of these bricks so I know where they fit into the body of the oven. I feel like this is a crucial step so that you do not get bricks mixed up. While this process of using the T-shaped cutter and the round nose cutter was slightly cumbersome and time consuming, I feel like the final product is really nice having the coils captured into the sidewalls of the oven. I will say that I'm not sure how much this affects the heating efficiency of the oven and how large that quarter inch slot really should be to maximize the heating efficiency of the oven but minimize the chance of the coils falling out. The good news is that if you're thinking that this quarter inch slot is not enough space for the heat of the coil to get into the center of the oven, you can easily come back with a file and open up that dimension. 
As y'all will see later in the build, my oven performed just fine with this quarter inch dimension. However, I may go back and enlarge it just to see if it makes a difference. While we are cutting the slots here, I will mention that the elements in these heat treating ovens and kilns are considered consumables, meaning that every couple of years or every five or so years, you may have to change them out. The larger gauge wires or the thicker wires, you have to change out less frequently. This is one reason why I went with a 16 gauge wire instead of an 18 gauge wire. As y'all will see later, in order to accommodate changing out these coils in the future, I only affixed the top, bottom, and sides of the oven together, and I left the back of the oven so that I can take it off and pull these wires through the groove and put new wires in. As y'all just saw up on the screen there, this is the new adhesive. I'm putting around an eighth of an inch on each block and then pushing the two blocks together, giving it a little wiggle so they're set, laying them down on a flat surface and letting them dry. After about 15 minutes of curing, I'll move in and make sure that the blocks are not attached to the wood surface with a little bit of a push. If you routed your grooves when the blocks were not attached like I did, make sure you don't have a lot of squeeze out in between the grooves because this will make feeding your coil through the grooves significantly more difficult. Here I'm cutting out some extra pieces. This will be the one inch risers on the base of my oven so that I will be able to achieve the five inch total height. If you are not putting these risers on the base of your oven, you will have a total height of around four inches. I wanted to have that extra inch, so I just put little one inch risers on both sides. While we have this mortar out, we're going to go ahead and make the back of the oven. The back of the oven will be 10 inches tall by 11 and a half inches wide. You'll have to cut a couple different bricks in order to make this dimension. I'll also make the front door of the oven out of two bricks, so it will be nine by nine. Once I have everything nice and dried and cured for 24 hours, I'll come back with a file and sandpaper just to make sure all of my flats are flat and my square corners are square. One method to make sure that the sides fit with the base is to actually just slide the whole assembly on top of the base and it will cut themselves to each other or mate themselves to each other fairly well. Once we have all of the sides mated, I take a pin and draw out the square opening on the back wall. This will allow me to drill my holes for the elements. Just drill the holes slightly larger than the max OD of your elements and then drill a center hole in the back wall for the thermocouple. Before sliding the coil into the groove, we will be stretching it out slowly so that we hit the exact dimension of our total groove length. While doing this, I am careful to make sure that I have an even stretch across the entire coil. I'll then use one of the pigtails on the end of the coil to help run it along the entire groove. You can see me using a file there to knock off some of the squeeze out that I had between the blocks. This is a little bit of a cumbersome process but I really like the finished results. If you ever have to replace these coils out of the back, I'm sure it will take a significant amount of time to finagle new coils in there, but I think that the final result is worth it. Like I mentioned before, I will be affixing both sides of the oven to the oven base, and then I will be affixing the top of the oven to both sides as well. When doing so, make sure that you're very careful, obviously not to knock any of these bricks down because they will break if they impact the ground. I then carefully clamp the oven together so that nothing moves during the curing process. Now that we have the oven body constructed out of bricks, it's time to cut out and fabricate our metal frame. Make sure that you measure twice and cut once because I definitely did not and I had to go back and modify some components of this frame. While it does add a little bit of complication to the build or at least a little bit of complexity, I wanted the ability to take this oven apart. So I drilled eight tabs here with a quarter inch hole so that I could take the lid off of the top of this frame and take the entire oven apart. As you can see here, I am welding together the base of my frame. It is obviously not wide enough and I will have to cut and add about two inches to the width of this base. These are going to be the feet of my oven. I had some leftover rubber feet from another project and they have a quarter inch stud coming out of one end of them. So I just took a piece of ankle and a piece of plate, drilled the hole in a piece of plate, and then I can thread these nice little rubber feet onto the bottom. 
the approximate dimensions of the frame that I'm building is going to be around 21 and 3 quarters of an inch long, about 12 inches tall, and about 13 and 5 inches wide. If I had to do it again, I would add probably 3 quarters of an inch to the total length in order to give me just a little bit more room on the back of the oven where there will be a thermocouple and the ceramic terminal blocks. In my design, there was just enough room for those things to fit, but it would have been nice to have a little bit of space there. To span the gaps between our angle iron frame, we will be using some aluminum flashing. I got a roll that is 14 inches wide by 10 feet long, and that was a perfect amount for this project. I also purchased a set of straight snips in order to cut this flashing to length. The good news is that all of the corners and edges will be hidden from view in the final product. For right now, I'm just going to lay down this flashing so I can mock up the oven, but I will come back and rivet that flashing to the frame. Using a razor blade, I then cut out the KO wool or the ceramic insulation 8 pound wool to the appropriate dimensions. Before putting the shell into the frame, I wanted to make sure that the front of the shell is fairly flat. To do so, I used a piece of sandpaper wrapped around the 2x4. I then put the shell into the frame and then the back onto the shell. This can be a fairly precarious process. Make sure that you have a pair of needle nose pliers around in order to help you pull the element pigtails through the holes that you drilled earlier. I will then affix four risers to the corners of this frame. The major reason why I have the bricks here is to lay the top down on top of the bricks with the one inch spacers and get an idea of where I need to weld on my tabs. Like I mentioned earlier, the top of the frame will be removable so I can pull the entire shell out. Now that the tabs are welded in their appropriate locations, I use an angle grinder to knock off all of the sharp corners so that I don't stab myself with these corners while moving this oven around. I then start welding on the door frame. We're going to be making the frame out of four pieces of angle iron and then it will be encompassing two fire bricks which are 9x9 nine nine in dimension. While we're here working on the door, we're going to rivet the flashing onto the door frame. To do this, I will be using some eighth of an inch rivets along with this cheap riveter that I bought off of Amazon. I found it fairly easy to use and for a small project like this, it was a perfect purchase. To temporarily hold the bricks into the door while I fabricate the hinges, I will be drilling four holes, two in the top and two in the bottom of the frame, and inserting some deck screws. I did end up leaving these in the final build just to have another way to hold the bricks in, but I will be mortaring the bricks into the frame later on. I put these risers onto the frame so that the hinges have a place to be welded to. Before welding the hinges onto the frame, I wanted to take the router bit and actually create a raised portion of the door. This is so that a little bit of the door will actually enter the oven chamber and make a better seal with the front of the oven. During the use of the oven, the whole body will expand and contract. So I wanted a little bit of the door to enter the chamber in order to get a better seal when the oven body is expanding and not rely solely on having a flat door versus a flat oven face. I then strap on the door assembly to the oven in order to hold it in place and weld on these small bullet hinges to the front of the oven. I weld them on in such a way that I can actually remove the door from the front of the oven. While this door assembly did get the job done, I feel like a hinge that incorporated some sort of spring to allow for movement on the hinge side against the face of the oven would be ideal since these ovens do expand and contract during operation. A spring on both sides of the door holding the door towards the oven I think would be ideal and maybe I will incorporate this into a future design. To make the door handle latch I am taking just a piece of all thread inside of an old hammer handle drilling a 16th of an inch hole through one end and inserting a steel dowel pin. This dowel pin will be able to be inserted into an oblong slot and turned a quarter turn to hold the oven closed. We will also be inserting a spring into this mechanism 
so at least one side of the oven door is held against the body of the oven. Getting all of the components inside of this piece of square tubing was a slight challenge. However, a couple pairs of needle nose pliers will help you get that job done. I'm using a lock nut, a nylock on the inside there and threading the entire rod through a spring and out of the other side of the square tubing. This spring tension I found to be a little too tight for this application. I was able to get it to work later on, but the initial startup of the oven, I had the spring tension too tight and I actually cracked a little bit of the bricks on the front of the oven that I later had to repair. So I would advise you to use a lighter spring or a very light spring in your application. I then put in this hardened dowel pin and slightly peened it so that it would not move. Here you can see that the door latch is working as it should. It is holding the door shut and as the oven expands, it will continue to hold the door shut. In order to add a little bit of rigidity to the frame and also to have a place to mount the control box, I put some eighth of an inch strap along both sides of this oven. I also welded some 90 degree angle plates in the front so that the hinge area has a little bit of support. I will be using this angled support on the right side of the oven in order to mount my limit switch. The limit switch will turn the elements off inside the oven whenever the door is opened. This eliminates the opportunity that you have when opening the oven to touch a knife to the coils and short them out. When you short out the coils, it could damage the machine and it can also electrocute you. I had this slotted piece of steel from an old grinder attachment. However, you can take a piece of steel and just drill some holes in it in order to get a 3 8 bolt in there and have the same effect that I have here. I then decide to paint the entire frame while I have the ability to easily take it all apart. And I painted it with some high temp barbecue pit paint that said it was good up to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. While I never foresee any component of the metal on this frame getting up to that kind of temperature, I felt like it was good practice to put high temp paint on a heat treating oven. I then drill some holes that are large enough to pass through some metric screws to attach the limit switch to the frame. Before attaching the limit switch to the frame, I just wanted to test it out and see how it worked. As you can see here, every time that the switch is engaged, the circuit is connected and every time that my finger is removed from the front of the switch, it stops that circuit from being made. This is obviously exactly what we want this switch to do. Next, we are going to be mortaring the bricks into the door frame. This mortar said that it's good for attaching metal to brick, so we're going to test that out. I put a very light coat of this mortar along the frame because I didn't want to change any of the dimensions too much on how the door fits up with the front of the oven. All right, so now we're gonna start the final assembly. I start off by drilling some holes and riveting the flashing to the bottom of the frame. I then lay down a one inch piece of KO wool and very carefully place the bricks into the metal frame. This is kind of a precarious spot here. I would probably rather do this with the oven frame on a lower surface. Once I have the bricks in the metal frame, I will position them into the middle of the frame. This gives me one inch on both sides for KO wool. I then made some sweet little pins here out of the 16 gauge wire that we use for the coils. And I will be pinning the back of the oven onto the top and the sides of the oven. This seemed to work fairly well and it allows me to take the back of the oven off if I ever need to replace the elements. I then cut the flashing out for the sides and the back of the oven. I will be sliding in the flashing and then riveting it to the sides. I want to do this before I put in the KO wool because this process would be significantly harder with the wool in the way. I then cut the wool to the appropriate length and width and start feeding it in to the sides of the oven. I will say that this took a while and this was actually kind of hard to do with everything together. So just take your time and use a stick to help you push the KO wool down into the groove. I also removed just a little bit of the width on one side so that I can get it down there easily. I then put the top onto the oven and that top will cover the tops of all the flashing. All right, now we're going to get into the wiring. Now this is going to be a long section. Make sure that you check out the description below and get the wiring diagram so you can follow along in this section. It's kind of confusing if you're not looking at a wiring diagram. I went ahead and put these ceramic block terminals 
on the back of the oven. All of them are rated for more than 20 amps and they can take high heat. I then used some 10 American wire gauge insulated wire to connect the elements to each other in series. From what I understand, connecting the coils on the back of the oven in series with this 10 gauge wire is superior to running a straight coil across the back of the oven on the inside. Once I have the two coils in series, I decide to test the resistance. Now, as we mentioned earlier in the build, adding four and a half inch pigtails to these things greatly reduced the ohms. And in this case, reduced it from 18.4 to 17.8. The good thing is that 17.8 ohms is still workable for our application. I measured the voltage coming out of my outlet at 245 volts and it plugged in the 17.8 ohms. It gave me a power of 3,372 watts at 13.7 amps, which works out to 9,962 watts per cubic foot. I feel like all of these numbers are well within safe operating conditions, and I haven't had any issues with the oven so far. This is a thermocouple that I had from a previous project that measured around 14 and a half inches long. I cut it down to around six and a half inches for this oven build. I then put it back together and plugged it into an old PID controller just to make sure that it still works. It's worth mentioning here that these wires can easily be attached incorrectly. I actually had them attached incorrectly here and I found out later in the build. In order to test if it's working correctly, put a heat gun or a hair dryer on the back of the thermocouple, the part that is outside the oven, and see if it drives your temperature down on your PID controller. In my case it did. And when I switched the wires, it actually started working accurately and the heat applied to the back of the thermocouple block did not drive the temperature down. So that's an easy test to do. The guys on Blade Forms got me lined out with that test and I thank them greatly because I was extremely confused when I first started testing this oven. Now that we have the thermocouple installed along with these terminal blocks, I will be installing some more 10 gauge wire, one to each of the remaining terminal blocks. And what these will do will be to connect these coils to our control box. To attach the terminal blocks and the thermocouple to the back of the oven, I just used some short deck screws here. I'm not sure if that's going to be an issue or not. I'm assuming these deck screws will get a little hot. But since we're dealing with ceramic, I don't think that's going to be a major issue. But I'll keep an eye on those screws just to make sure they're not damaging anything. So we're about to go through the wiring of the PID control box. Now, it's a little difficult to film a wiring video so I did my best here and I tried to cut this wiring in such a way that you can follow along with the wiring diagram. The first thing I did is apply some thermal paste onto the heat sinks that come with these SSRs. These SSRs will be what is turning on the power to your elements. It's basically turning it on and off quickly so that it can control the temperature. We also have some high end or at least high amperage switches and some fuse holders along with this high-end Arbor, I think it's like a $90 PID controller. And the reason I went with a higher-end PID controller is so that I have the option to build some ramping programs. A lot of the cheap PID controllers just give you the option to turn it on to a specific temperature, but this one gives you some flexibility with your programming. I tried a couple different ways for cutting out the holes for each of these components, and I found the best and easiest way for me was using a diamond bit from Harbor Freight on my die grinder. That actually got the holes done fairly smoothly. The whole drilling holes and cutting was pretty cumbersome. For my extension cable, I'm using some thick 10-3 here. You know, the longer your cable is gonna be, the thicker it needs to be. You could probably get by with some 12 gauge wire here, but I wanted this to be overbuilt, and I think it's good practice whenever building a heat treating oven or a kiln to make it overbuilt. So the first step here is to come from our wall power, which is gonna be 245 volts via a 620p outlet, and go straight in to 20 amp fuses with both sides, the black and the white wire here of our power. I will thread the ground wire out of the bottom of the box, and this will later be attached to our frame. I'll then screw down the SSRs, and that's one reason why I picked this control box, is because you can use some screws to attach your components to the back of the box. I thought this was really nice from an organizational standpoint. I'm gonna be using 12 gauge wire that's high temp in this box for pretty much all the connections. 
I ordered about 11 feet of this 12 gauge wire and I wish I would have ordered around 15 to 16 feet. It got a little tight towards the end there and I wish I had some extra. One of the tools I bought for this build was these orange wire strippers here. These things were pretty cool. They strip the ends of your wires and they also have a crimping attachment in the middle so that you can crimp all of your connectors. I'll make sure to put links for all the tools I use in this video along with all of these components for the build in the description below. So after we go to each 20 amp fuse, both lines will go to a single throw double pull switch that's rated for 250 volts at 30 amps. After the switch, we're going to go to these terminal blocks on both sides. I found that these really help clean up the wiring inside this box. I'm sure you could have done the same thing with cable connectors, but I kind of like having a clean finished product. These terminal blocks are rated for about 25 amps and they come with these little jumpers to help keep everything connected on one of the blocks. So downstream of the switch, we will run one line to one terminal block and the other line to the other thus energizing each of the blocks. So using my new El Cheapo multimeter here, I wanted to verify that I had a connection when the switch was turned on. And when I turn the switch off, I no longer have a connection. So that's kind of a nice little feature on these cheap multimeters. So we're going to be installing another fuse on this box. This is going to be either a one or a two amp fuse. And the goal of this fuse is to protect your PID controller. The PID controller really shouldn't be pulling a bunch of amps. So if you're getting above the two amp mark, you risk damaging your expensive PID controller. So to wire in this fuse, we will run a jumper from the terminal block in the middle there to the back of the fuse, and then another jumper from the back of the fuse onto spot 10 on the Arbor PID controller. And just for notes, that Arbor controller is product number SYL-2352P. So while we're here, we're going to finish off this terminal block. We're going to run a jumper from the middle terminal block, which we've already connected to number 10 of the PID controller. And we're going to run that all the way around to the SSR. We're going to be connecting that to port number two on the SSR. This will provide power to the elements when the SSR is swapped on. So moving over to the top terminal block, we're going to be running a jumper from that block to the other SSR in location number one. The location number two on the top SSR and location number one on the bottom SSR will be connected to the elements. We'll then run a jumper from the top terminal block onto location number nine on the PID controller. Now that we're done with the terminal blocks, I'm gonna put these nifty little covers on top of them in order to protect them from touching any other wires or shorting out. We'll then put a jumper between spots four on both SSRs and spots three on both SSRs. So as you can see here, I have a different wire. I told you I ran a little low on the wires. And if you're going to be using a lower gauge wire, this is the spot to use it. We're going to be connecting the SSR to an element switch. So this switch will be able to turn the elements on and off. To do that, we connect up to the positive side of the SSR and then run a line to the element switch. And then from the element switch, we'll run it to number seven on the PID controller. And this is gonna be the positive location on the PID controller. What this will do is tell the SSR to turn on and off. And when the switch is off, it will stop the SSRs from working. We will also do the same thing for the limit switch running off the negative side of the SSRs connecting to spot number eight. Now we're at the point where we have to connect the control box to the side of the machine so that we can connect the rest of the wires. To do so, I'm just using some self-tapping sheet metal screws and connecting it to that strap that we welded onto the side of the frame. We're then going to connect the wires to our limit switch. One wire will go to the SSR on the negative side and the other wire will run all the way to terminal eight on the PID controller. One note on limit switches, there are a lot of different types of limit switches. This is a push button type, but there's also some that have a little arm on them and they will pretty much all work for this application. Looking back on it, I think that the arm style limit switches have a little bit larger of an operating range. So that could actually be pretty useful when building one of these ovens. Uh, as it is now, if the oven heats up, 
a great amount and I don't have that nut set just right, it will actually disengage the switch. So make sure that A, you're using the appropriate limit switch and B, that if you are using a push button type, you can adjust the pressure on the switch because if you can't adjust it, you may find your oven turning off frequently. So now that we have the limit switch hooked up to port number seven on the PID controller, we're going to bring in the element wires and attach them to the remaining two posts on the SSRs. I'm using some pretty thick wire here so it can be a little cumbersome making tight bins inside of the box, but with a little bit of patience, we got them connected just fine. The last thing we're gonna hook up here inside the box is going to be the thermocouple wire. Note that these are backwards. The red in this wire is actually not positive. And that is what I mentioned earlier in the video on how I had all of the leads on the thermocouple backwards. So once we have all of the wiring done inside the box, we can push all the components into their proper locations. And lastly, we can connect our ground wire on the bottom of our frame here so that the entire box is grounded to the frame. And that is how the PID control box is wired for a heat treating oven. Once again, if any of that was confusing, make sure you print out the wiring diagram and follow along next time you watch the video. It helps out a lot. And I tell you what, when I'm doing the narration, I followed along with the wiring diagram myself because some of this stuff can be kind of hard to remember. The last piece of flashing we're gonna put on is on the back here. I made sure to not rivet this flashing on. I just used some self-tapping screws, once again, to keep with the spirit of being able to take this thing apart. Then we'll put the door on the front, make sure that it's engaging the limit switch on the bottom. You wanna get this thing adjusted so that it is pretty tightly closed when the oven is off, and then it has a little bit of room to expand. So here are some modifications I made after the first couple of cycles I ran with the oven. I put some heat shield on the back of the control box. I had this stuff laying around and I don't think it was 100% necessary to do, but I like the idea of shielding this control box from the body of the oven. I also used some half inch nuts here just to space the control box off from the oven a little bit more. I think this will also help with the transference of heat between the body of the oven and the back of the control box. You may have noticed in some of the previous shots there that there were some cracks on the front of the oven that I repaired. That was because I had the door closed too tightly. What you see me doing here is making a knife rack for the inside of the oven. I used some of the old sections of the thermocouple wire so that I can drive them in to a piece of soft fire brick and make a nice rack for the inside of the oven. All this stuff is rated to pretty high temps, so I don't have to worry about any of it getting degraded over time or building up high levels of oxidation. Once I have these rods positioned and mortared into the base here, I'm going to give it 24 hours to cure and then put it in the oven for a test cycle. This controller can be a little daunting to use at first, so I highly advise reading the manual before giving it a go. First thing I'm gonna do here is put the oven on on-off control by changing the auto-tune function to zero. What this will do is ramp it hard to your set point. I then hold down the AM button to get into the programming. I set the first temperature to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Then I set the first time to 300, the second temperature to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, the second time to zero, and I put negative one on all the other set points. And what this will do is ramp the oven up to 1500 degrees and hold it there for at least 300 minutes, which is far longer than the test that I plan to do. So I'll throw a performance graph up on the screen here. This oven, from what I can tell, operates just as good as other DIY ovens that people have made, which is more than good enough for my applications. Here, once I get to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm gonna change the auto-tune setting to two so that it will run an auto-tune cycle. What this does is it finds the appropriate PID set points for this controller to operate at 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see that once the auto-tune is complete, it will get back up to 1500 and maintain it there within two degrees plus and minus, which is definitely adequate for my needs. While we have this thing ramped up, I'm gonna open up the control box and see what kind of temperature my SSRs are running. Both of them are running around 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm then gonna do a 10 second door open test and see how long it takes to get back to 1500 degrees. It took around 70 to 80 seconds to get back to 1500 degrees. 
just for fun since I'm a knife maker I put a knife into this steel and got it up to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit when I took it out I made sure at least that it was non-magnetic this is not a perfect indication that it's at 1500 but it gives me an idea that it's at least around 1450 plus I also plan on heat treating some stainless with this oven and I have been able to get this oven up to 1975 degrees Fahrenheit it took about 88 minutes to do so since we're towards the end here I'll put up the numbers for what this oven cost me to build it came in significantly cheaper than the store-bought model at around $800. So that's it guys. I hope you all really enjoyed the video. If you did, hit that like button down below and consider subscribing to the channel. I'm going to be using this oven on all my knives going forward, so you will get a good idea of its performance by subscribing to the channel. Also, if you want to help out the channel in other ways, I put affiliate links to all of the products and tools in the description below, as well as a link to my Patreon if you feel like becoming a patron. And as always, until the next time, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.